Well, Australia's reporting season is set to kick off. The company's gearing up to bear all. But where is the smart money heading into what is an extremely volatile period for Aussie equities? Well, joining us to deliver his insights and how to navigate reporting season, James Spensley, founder and fund manager at Moore, joins us live in studio. James Spensley, thanks very much for your time uh, this morning. Look, you have a particular focus in terms of where in the index, and we'll get to, get to that, but your thoughts leading into reporting season as to how we're likely to fare and where expectations are. Well, expectations are pretty high. I mean, yeah. we've seen some incredible runs in some of the, the darling stocks. And if you look at names like Afterpay, Altium, WiseTech, um, these stocks uh, and many more Bellamy's, they're all up significantly in the last sort of 12 months. So that's going to have huge you know, requirements for earnings growth. Um, and if they don't hit it, if they, don't, they miss it or there's, there's some issues around it, there's some, some big risks in there. What do you think has led this? And, and What's led it and what, whose money is it? What's the money that's actually underpinning this extraordinary price appreciation for a lot of these stocks? Yeah, I think we've got a bit of a theory that, you know, given the banks, you know, have been on the nose, large cap fund managers, you know, how, could you invest in the banks in the last mm. six months, you know, going into a Royal Commission and, and during it? So I think the money, you know, that's a huge part of the, the big cap index. Um, you know, Telstra, you know, almost uninvestable for, for many fund managers. So that money has had to find a new home. And I think that money has flowed down to the top end of small caps into these names. So if you notice what's happened, we've had a massive expansion, massive price run in the top end of small caps. Anything that's a billion and a half liquid, you know, looks and smells as close to a, to a big cap as possible, they've all run incredibly hard. Um, you know, up 50, 100 percent, a lot of these stocks. Uh, but at the other end of the scale, the index is only up 3 percent. Right. So there's got to be a huge part of the index that actually hasn't moved or gone backwards. And that money that's found its way into the, the bigger, more, more liquid, you know, favourite growth stocks, is, as, as they're known, what's the sort of characteristics of, of that money? You know, a lot of people traditionally say, you know, retail money is far stickier than institutional money. I mean, is there a, a worry that at any sign of, you know, bad news or not even meeting elevated market expectations, that that money's going to run? Well, I think that's the risk. When, when money doesn't sit in its natural home, um, it tends to fly back home very quickly uh, at the side of any risk. Um, the big issue is these guys are searching for some growth and yep. they've come down. but. It's pretty small in their portfolio. You know, it might only be two or three basis points. So when they sell, you know, see something you know, they don't like, they're just quick, I'm out of it. It doesn't make a difference to them, but of course they can scorch the stock on the way out. So let's talk about some of these stocks, and then we're going to get to some of the ones that you think are uh, probably better value. Probably leading the pack, certainly over the past uh, couple of weeks, it's got to be Afterpay. Absolutely. Unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable run. I mean, unbelievable stock. First of all, incredible yes. model. Love it. I mean, these guys you know, have a real chance of being a $10 billion business. But the share price run has been incredible. I mean, look, you know, Afterpay is up about 134% in six months. Uh, that is incredible. But, you know, earnings projections are only up 100% for it. So you kind of look at that and say, you know, this is multiple expansion. This is not people upgrading their earnings. So, you know, there's more and more people flowing into this stock. And again, I think that creates a little bit of risk. Stock's trading on 100 times PE. Mm. Triple digit. Yeah. You've got the other ones. That, the, the, and I, I suppose you'd, you could throw Afterpay into the, the tech space, but your Altiums, your Appins, yep. the Wise Techs, I mean, all fit in this. Good businesses, but it's just what? The market's enthusiasm for it's run a little bit too far ahead? Yeah, exactly right. I think um, you know, all, all of those businesses are on you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, you know, 80 times um, PE. So you know, that's just showing people are incredibly enthusiastic about these businesses. Um, the earnings growth hasn't kept up with that. So, you know, that again just creates risk around these stocks. All of them brilliant businesses, there's no question, but you want to buy brilliant businesses on the right price, you know, not on the wrong price, and, and not when suddenly everyone ends, heads for the exit. And, and that is usually around earnings, earnings season. And we saw that in February, actually. I, from memory, WiseTech had a pretty sizable fall. I mean, it's, it's come back and, and moved above beyond that. But do you, do you look for an opportunity like that with, with these sorts of stocks, or do you need to see significant? revision in terms of share price to actually start getting interested again. I think the market is just so so um, you know, unfair to the stocks at the moment. You know, miss earnings by 5% and the stock can be off 30 yeah. to 40%. Um, so that's pretty significant. So we're, we're looking very carefully at these stocks through earnings. So we don't own a lot of these high growth names. Um, mm. You know, the expansion multiples has just you know, been too great for us. Um, that's probably hurt us as a fund. Um, but you know, we, we tend to focus on preserving capital first, not, not gains. Um, what does it tell you about sentiments in, in markets though? You know, 
it's, it seems, you know, I always, always picture a boat, you know, and everyone's going to one side of the boat as far as these trades are concerned. Yeah. You know, things are going to get a little bit hairy if you start to get any kind of um, swell. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we've got. If you look at the PE multiple and, and what it's done over the last five years between the top 100 and the small cap index, it's at an all-time delta. You know, uh, the small cap index has gone probably two and a half times PE expansion. In the same time, the you know, large cap index has, has done nothing. It's, it's pretty flat. So you look at that and say, there's a huge amount of money in a huge amount of people running for one side of the boat, as you say. Um, and then when you look at even further down, you look at what's happened within that small cap index, it's the larger ones that have done all yeah. of that lifting. Um, so it's, it's sort of everyone running to the side of the boat and then all the luggage and everything else coming along with it as well. Let's get to some of the stocks that you think are, are worth yeah. considering for, for a portfolio. And just explain why these, and we'll go through them because we've got the share price of them. We'll start with Webjet. Why? Like, what is it about the way these are priced and their business outlooks that you think you, know, you think are, are worth considering? Yeah. I mean, we can you know, probably take all day to talk about the business outlooks. Um, Webjet's a great business. It's got uh, acquisitions. Uh, it's got you know, geographical reach. Yep. Uh, it's going into a really strong summer period in, uh, in North America. So, you know, we like that business. Um, incredible management team, which is always mm. really crucial for me. That's, uh, my, my job is to really evaluate the management team more than anything else. I'm not as good as Excel models as my partner. <laughs> or, or, or the others. Um, so Webjet's, Webjet's great, um, the, but you look at that business and you say that's had 27% uh, price appreciation in six yeah. months, but it's got you know, forward-looking sort of 38% EPS growth and you know, it's trading on 21 times. What is it, let's, to your specialty then, you know, judging management, judging the people, and really when you get to you know, small caps, it's extraordinarily, well any company I suppose, it's extraordinarily important. What is it that you look for? Oh, I think it's just how people answer the question. You know, that, that to me is really key. Um, I know when I was sitting across the table from a bunch of fund managers mm. running Vocus, you, when they ask you a tough question, you know, it's how you answer it and what you don't say more than what you say. Uh, and I think you can gauge certainly, first of all, you know, are they telling you everything? Are they really positive? So it's, you know, some people say it's body language, you know, but it, I think it's just it's also about the way that they approach it. And, you know, do they like to bear all and tell you the bad things as well as just the good things? Yeah. In small cap, you know, a lot of these, especially at the smaller end, these are small businesses. These are people who don't have market ex experience. And they can sit there and they can tell you all of the good stuff and then what's the risk in your business? Oh, we don't have any. You know? <laughs> and that's, that's the number one sign, don't invest, right? What are the risks for Webjet? Uh, look, risk from Webjet, you know, it's, it's, it's a massive business. It's got a lot of, it's travel related. Um, so it's, you know, there's, there's just so much to do with travel. You know, it's oil price, ticket price, um, you know, competition. Um, they're up against some sort of PE-backed mm. um, businesses in terms of what, who they compete against. So, you know, that's the fundamental sort of side. But valuation stacks up on that. You know, it is a, it is a good business with scale. It's liquid uh, and it's trading on, you know, a, a much lower multiple. Yeah. Let's get to another one, Speedcast. This is a stock we really like. Yeah. Speedcast, um, it's a telecommunications company that provides, you know, telco services, satellite services to, um, you know, offshore oil platforms, cruise ships, all of those types of businesses. Um, very acquisitive, carries a high deal level of debt, uh, which is the opportunity, and it carries debt sort of three, three and a half times EBITDA, which for the Australian market is is uh, very high, um, but they're making great acquisitions, EPS accretive, uh, it's up 12% in the last six months. We've got it doing sort of 30% EPS growth in the next 12 months. I mean, it's growing like a freight train and it's on a 15 times PE. Is that right? It's really cheap. And a lot of the reason is some fund managers or many fund managers can't invest because the amount it's or, or the investment process won't have anything above three times EBITDA. I've had a couple of people suggest that this can also move off the back of the oil price. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you're bullish on the outlook for oil, which most of the market is, that this actually feeds well into speed cuts. So a very, very leveraged way to play oil price without having to understand, you know, macro oil <laughs> dynamics, you know, which we're not at all good at. So speed cuts is a fantastic way. If you're bullish on oil, oil's at what, you know, close to 70 bucks, mm. around $70. Um, that's great. You know, they bought a, their largest competitor when oil was down around $40. So they made some smart acquisitions at the bottom of the cycle. Uh, that will give them some, you know, some pretty big leverage as it comes up. And you Great management? Great management really well, yeah. Good integrators, um, really straight shooters, uh, and know their business backwards. Ben. Bing is bingo. Bin, yeah, bingo. Yeah. Talk, talk me through this one. Well, this is one of our sort of thematic ideas, but bingo is uh, relatively new to the markets. But this is probably not, not even a year ago, I'm, I'm going to say. Um, they take recycling from sort of you know, corporate clients, you know, building sites. Um, the big difference, so like a clean away, mini clean away. Yep. Yeah, um, yep. The big difference from Bingo is they actually take their products, they have recycling plants of their own. Uh, they recycle about 80% of the waste that they take right. and landfill 
Whereas a clean away would landfill, just pick it up and landfill it because mm. they own landfills. Uh, landfilling is really expensive and the price is going up. The government's not introducing any more landfills, uh, certainly in the near term, sort of five years. Uh, so, you know, by recycling 80% of it, it's, um, it's a, environmentally friendly, but it's also a great way to win business from customers. If you go up against CleanAway who's just landfilling 100% and you say, hey, by the way, we're green, we're actually going to recycle 80%, you could almost charge a premium for that. Yeah. So I think they're in a, as a newcomer nibbling away at a market, they're in a really good position. And does this fit into, because this one of the thematics, millennials. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, most people sort of... Uh, you know, yeah are vintage and older probably you know pull their hair out a little bit um, yeah. when it comes to the millennials to some degree how do you how do you profit on millennials from an investment perspective yeah it's an interesting one I, look millennials are going to drive how we interact and what does well in the next 15 years right a millennial yeah. is probably on average you know 15 16 18 years um, they're starting to go into the workforce they're going to be the big earners they're going to be the big spenders they don't have mortgages they're going to define how you know what does well in, in corporate australia in the next 10 years so we play, place a lot of time trying to understand what a millennial is you know speak to my nieces speak to anyone anyone under 20 when i get the chance um, and the amazing thing is they're all really environmentally and socially mm. conscious you know the, the the baby boomers at the extreme probably don't you know climate disbelievers climate change disbelievers not to generalize um, you know our generation is probably somewhere in the middle you know the millennials are very focused on uh, on you know climate change and doing good so you know we're seeing that we're seeing a lot of change in, in plastic bags are going out of woolies yep. now um, I think plastic bottles you know, can't be around for very much longer. Really? So you see that momentum has just to continue? Right? Yeah, I mean, the, you think about it, you, you, know, you get 24 b plastic bottles delivered to your house and you throw them away, and most yeah. of them aren't recyclable. Yeah. That's the amazing thing. They, just, they used to, and before January, get shipped to China and dumped in a landfill in China. We actually used to do that, you know, freight it across the world to, to dump it in someone else's backyard. It just doesn't sound like that's scalable and, and that millennials and voters and people are going to be uh, putting up with that. Maybe we're going back to the milkman as well, who delivers yeah, the milk maybe. in the, in the, in maybe. the reusable yeah. uh, glass jars. It's good, they're, it's good they're decent people. They might look after us in our old age. You know? <laughs> um, can we get to the, the last group of stocks that, um, that, that you've got for us? Stable companies that are really cheap. Yeah, look, I think one of, one of the key things in terms of looking at the market at the moment is, you know, if people are going to miss earnings, you know, if you're on a 14, 13 times PE, you're not going to drop 50%, right? You're not yeah. going to, if you miss by 5%, you know, it's not going to be half the stock to a six times PE. So we really like um, IPH, the intellectual property lawyer role up there. Great systems, um, very acquisitive, but they get more margin out of businesses they acquire. Uh, US dollars helping them mm. strongly, a lot of US dollar revenue there. Um, so we think that's, you know, that's probably got some upgrades coming. And that's trading on, look, IPH is trading 17 times. Trade Me is an interesting one. A few of the guys we have on fund managers really like Trade Me, yeah. TME, the, the ticket code. Yep. They're, they're kind of eBay, um, they're a bit of everything, aren't they? A bit of everything. It's like an New REA Zealand. and eBay yeah. and you know, it's all, all together. Um, why? What is it about Trade Me that, that, that you like, particularly IE being in that, sort of that, that group of stable companies? Yeah, I think the, the thing is it's got a lot of leverage. Um, it's been probably hammered on the market when Facebook yeah. um, Marketplace was yep. touted. Um, I don't know if anyone's used Facebook Market. I'm, I've never found anyone who has. Um, I get a pop-up every so often once you know, saying there's something actually listed on it. So that hasn't been the big, the big issue for it um, that it has. So, you know, good operational leverage. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a software business at the end of the day. Um, that can do a lot more than the market's expecting. Mm. And, you know, what is it trading on 18 times? It's again, compared to some of those other businesses, are cheap. And th this one probably surprised me the most. Gem G8 Education, because yeah. this does this polarises Absolutely. a bit. You either love it or hate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, look, we're we're in the camp where we're kind of in, in between. You know, there's periods where it's you know it was probably uninvestable with mm. you know CEOs and chairmen and 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 just the way the governance issues. Uh, but look, the, the government changes to, to childcare rebates from 1 July is going to be a tailwind. That's absolutely the case. There's been an oversupply in the market, which is why the stock hasn't done well. I think it's sort of off 25% in the six months and, and more for the 12 months. But I think that's going to turn around slowly as people realise that you know, they can actually go back to the workforce. That doesn't happen the day, day one. So I think they'll, they'll be a, a pretty good winner and that's trading, what, 11 times? I know there's people who always can be natural scam skeptics around roll-up businesses, particularly yeah. if you're a roll-up business that then has somebody else come into the market, which has somewhat happened with, with G8 education. I mean, do you need to factor that in as well when you're looking at what you're willing to pay? For yeah, I think company. markets either really love roll-ups or they really hate them. Yeah. Yeah. National Vets yeah. is a great example. Yeah. That yep. did incredibly well for an incredibly long period of time. Uh, you know, G8 did well for a while. Um, you know, roll-ups... Look, G8's rolled up a lot of stuff a long time ago now. That's true. So it's actually starting to be you know, more of an organic story than a, than a roll-up story. Yeah. 
opportunities in in reporting season is 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 it the opportunity is it one of the you know twice a year where you get the good opportunities in markets do you think i think this is this is probably one you know best of five years you know there's yeah. there's going to be a lot of movement and you know potentially big sectors of the index re-rating or, or or doing well um, so we're, we're pretty excited uh, just before we let you go something that a lot of people have been talking about at the moment the notion of growth as we were and you were discussing in a whole bunch of stocks that uh, um that people should be a little bit cautious about going into reporting season. When does that flip? The idea of everyone going with with growth, whether it be you know GARP or GAP, and actually start going back to you know value stock yeah. pick, value stock picking. Uh, you know what it is? Is I think it comes after something's run incredibly hard. These things are on all time high sort of multiples. Mm -hmm. One or two disappoint, and suddenly everyone you know runs for the doors. And where do you run to? You run to the the safer value names. It's it happens. It's just cyclical. You know the market gets very excited. Things go up. They keep going up. People buy into it. Causes it to go up. They all exit. That money has to go somewhere. Yeah. It, you know mandates in fund managers are 95, 97 percent fully invested. So where do they go? They go down to a you know to to where they're not going to get their fingers burnt. All right, James Bensley, brilliant to have all of those tips from you today. Thanks so much for your time. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. James Bensley there from More. We need to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk trade wars. Stay with us.